All right, good morning. good morning. Well, here we are, speeding toward Christmas. You know, I know um, one of the things, as this was certainly an impetus for me, uh, that brings many people to the spiritual path is when we're going through a particular difficulty, some form of suffering. You know, people have a death in the family or a breakup of a relationship, a job ends, on and on and on. Something changes. There's some difficulty with life. And this is often the doorway uh, for people to look for that something spiritual, that teaching that will help us to change our life, to, to give us tools to cope with what's happening in life and even go deeper. So it seems like a crisis is often an invitation to spirit. Now they say that in Chinese, the, uh, the character for crisis and opportunity are the same character in, in that language. Uh, but since I don't actually speak or read Chinese, I don't know that that's true. But, but I've heard that, and it sounded really good, so I thought I'd share it. All right, so um, I think that you know, uh, when we go through um, a particular difficulty, whatever that might be for us, there's something inherent within that that forces us to look uh, for the wholeness that's deep within us, that forces us to, I have to remember, there is a place within me that is not touched by this external difficulty that I'm going through right now. Because that wholeness that is within every, each and every one of us is what we teach in the science of mind. There is a principle of wholeness within us that cannot be hurt, harmed, or endangered in any way by the things that are taking place on the outer plane experience of our life. So 500 years before uh, the birth of Jesus, Buddha comes onto the planet. And Buddha, his story is such an interesting story because he is a, uh, he's born into extraordinary privilege. He's a young prince. And um, there had been prophecy around his birth, and so his father thought in that way that we hear sometimes uh, that he could sort of push the prophecy in the direction that the father wanted. And what the father wanted was for him to become a great, uh, a great leader. Uh, it was told that he would either become a great leader uh, and warrior, or he would become a spiritual, a great spiritual teacher. So his father, who was in charge of a whole kingdom, clearly wanted him to become the great leader, uh, not particularly follow the spiritual thing. So what the father did was that all of Buddha's young life, he protected him from seeing anything difficult or unpleasant. Um, but as young men will do, he got to an age where he wanted to see what was outside the walls of the kingdom. And so he got his charioteer to take him out at night. You know, they would slip out of the castle. And it was during these uh, nighttime adventures that Buddha, for the very first time, sees a very old person. He'd never seen anybody old because his father so controlled his experience that he didn't want him to see people aging. He sees an ill person. Imagine he'd never seen anybody in his life who was dealing with illness, and he'd never seen a dead body. Yeah, so imagine, you know, how he'd never seen old age, sickness, or death. And so he asks his charioteer, he says, to who do these things happen? And the charioteer says, to everyone. And so they were called, uh, those individuals that the Buddha uh, witnessed uh, were, were called the heavenly messengers. And so this brings us to the question of how do we live in a life with such difficulty? You know, the, the, and this is what Buddha was wondering, this, this, this very privileged prince. So, you know, without any metaphysical BS, you know what I mean, the, uh, you know, it's, it's all perfect and all that kind of stuff without that. You know, difficult stuff happens. If you live for very long on the face of the earth at all, you know that there, difficult stuff happens. It's just part of what we go through. I don't think your consciousness is bad or you did particular things to create it. Stuff, bless you, anything for a blessing. Stuff, sometimes difficult stuff crops up in our life. So he and the charioteer continue on these outings, and then he sees a hermit who is a holy man, one who has developed sufficient consciousness. And, and the prince realizes, Prince Buddha, the prince uh, who will become the Buddha, realizes that he has to face the sorrows of life and attempt to find a way beyond their grasp. Right? And so the Difficulty, I think, we encounter in life demands that we wake up. So what if when we had some difficult experience in life, we knew that that was a call for us personally, individually, oh, this is a place where I'm supposed to wake up. This is not, you know, because what happens, happens so often, and I include myself in this, is that when difficulty comes up, we say, oh, my God, this is going to be hard. I'll go unconscious. 
Yes, Pepperidge Farm and I will go to the sofa, <laughs> right? And turn on the TV or get on the computer or do the things I do to go unconscious. But what if those difficulties show up in our life as a call for us deeply, deeply, you know, a, a demand from life that, hey, this is supposed to wake you up. You know, as much as we may have uh, tried, you know, we cannot, I think, uh, shop away or drink away or eat away or drug away or compute away those things, you know. Um, they just postpone what is inevitable, that at some point we're going to have to deal with that. So I believe our destiny, all of us as spiritual beings, is that we will become deep people who deal with very deep things. You know? Now maybe we'll do it in this life, or maybe we can just try putting it off to another experience, but I don't think that there's really any escape from what we are destined to, uh, to move through and grow through. So. A woman brought a very limp parrot into the veterinary hospital. Yes. And as she lay the parrot on the table, the vet pulled out his stethoscope and listened to the bird's chest. And after a moment, two, the vet shook his head and sadly said, I'm sorry, Polly has passed away. And the distress, distressed owner, she just wails and she said, are you sure? I mean, you haven't done any tests. Aren't there some tests you can do? You know, you haven't done anything. You know, he might just be in a coma or sleeping or something like that. And so the vet says, well, okay. And he turns and he leaves the room for a moment. And he returns later with a big Labrador retriever. And as the bird's owner looks on in amazement, the dog stands up on his hind legs, puts his front paws on the examining table, and, and he sniffs the dead bird from head to tail, top to bottom. And then the lab turns to the vet and with extraordinarily sad eyes, shakes his head, <laughs> shakes his head, and walks out of the examining room. So the vet goes out again, and this time he comes back with a cat. The cat jumps up onto the examining table and sniffed very delicately at the bird. The cat sits back, shakes his head, meows, head down, jumps down off the table, runs out of the room. The vet looks at the woman and says, well, I'm sorry, but like I said, your parrot is definitely 100% certifiably deceased. I'm really sorry. And he turns to his computer terminal and hits a few keys and produces a bill, which he hands to the woman. And the parrot's owner, still in shock, took the bill and she goes, $200? Are you kidding? $200 just to tell me that my bird was dead? And the vet shrugged and said, well, if you've taken my word for it, the bill would have been only $25. But with a lab report and a CAT scan, what did you expect? <laughs> Come on. Come on, it's clean, it's cute. I know, you make fun of it now, but you're going to tell it later. I know you, I know you, I know. Because people come back and say, oh, so-and-so told me your joke from Sunday. And, uh huh, uh huh, and they were the ones who went, ugh. Right. Okay. Now, the, the other side of this consciousness thing is also something that calls us to awaken. You know, I think that there is a, a wholeness, a beauty, and, and in the Sufi tradition, which is the mystical arm of Islam, Sufis call it the voice of the beloved, this place of wholeness, this place of beauty that's within, the return to our own true nature. Now, Ernest Holmes, in The Science of Mind, calls it the Christ, our own wise and knowing heart. Now, in the Zen teaching, they teach uh, the sacred uh, the sac they t there's this teaching of the sacred ox, which I always thought was really an interesting thing because the ox representing uh, the wondrous and powerful qualities that are in every person, and they awaken as we discover our true nature. It, it, it can't be lost, right? So there is something, there, there's a saying that the Christ only goes where it's invited. So since this is not about being outside of us, right? But, but it is actually a presence, a principle, a power, a potential that already exists within us. If we choose to, 
we have the capacity, we have the freedom to invite it forward into greater expression in our life. Now, I think the world is demanding of us that, that we grow up spiritually. I think that's what's happening right now. You know, and we can do it willingly or we can do it by force. Because of course, in A Course in Miracles, it says we can learn through joy or we can learn through pain. And people often ask me, like, why do the lessons have to be so painful? And I say, well, you know, so often joy doesn't get our attention. When something joyful is happening, when something nice is happening, when something pleasant is happening in our life, we just sort of brush over it. We don't look at it and say, wow, what a blessing this is. This also could be teaching me something. Because, you know, when things are going well in people's life, I often ask them, to say, look at what you're doing now. When things are going well, notice what you're doing, what you have been doing in the weeks preceding when life is really good. Because that's been contributing to the experience you're having. Just like when things are not going well, we also look and say, well, what have I been doing? What have my habit patterns been? What have my tendencies been? How has my spiritual practice been? What's my dialogue been? Have I been engaging in you know, horrifically negative conversations with people? Have I just had a really bleak outlook? See, because I think my, my preference is that we learn what we need to, personally, my preference is to learn what I need to learn willingly and I tell myself all the time that I can learn through joy, I don't have to learn through pain. Because I don't know about you, but I feel like I've learned as much as I need to learn through painful experiences. Don't you feel that way? Like if I knew that like I was done with all the painful experiences and it's like, okay, from here on out, everything that God, that spirit, that the universe is going to teach me is going to come through joy, I feel like, bring it on. Like, I'm on board. Bring it on. That sounds really, really good for me, to me. So for many of us, when, when we're okay, you know, things when things are not too bad, I think we're not motivated to grow. See, this is the thing. They say, oh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look within later, you know? Uh, but, you know, rather than do that spiritual work now, God, there's a sci-fi marathon on, and I really want to watch that. So we start to watch the sci-fi marathon, and while we're watching the sci-fi marathon, what I notice is it keeps reminding me of spiritual things that I should be attending to. Um, if, if we don't initiate our own growth. See, there is a principle involved here. If we do not initiate our own spiritual growth, growth will initiate us. It's going to happen, right? So I think, well, I would rather uh, do, do my work in my seat rather than have to experience it, like I say, out on the street, right? Because those are the choices. You can handle it, you can handle the issues in your seat, or you can act them out on the street. The problem with acting them out on the street is it's usually unpleasant and embarrassing. So I'd much rather do it sitting in my own little prayer chair and, and work on things that way. You know, lots of religions talk about this light that is in each person. We certainly do. And in the science of mind, Ernest Holmes refers to this light as the Christ. It is that spark of divinity already within. It's already within. You don't have to do anything to earn it. It's a spark of divinity that's already within us waiting to be brought forth, waiting to be cultivated. You know, um, this week uh, in Scandinavia was the, the sol solstice. Uh, they, on December 13th, they um, celebrate St. Lucia. Uh, and St. Lucia is uh, uh, a young girl who comes with a crown of candles, and, and they sing songs early in the morning. And, um, and it's all about the return of the light. You know? uh, the longest uh, uh, darkness is over. And now the, each day will start to be a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter. So Christ is that part of us that knows that we are one with God and expresses that oneness through an energy of unconditional love. It's, it, it is just a part of our being. That, and now that can sound like a really tall order in our world today. But the truth is, you know, as we heal our own darkness, we become an opening for more of the light of Christ to bless and heal humanity, right? So this is, I think, a really great incentive for us to heal those places where we feel separate from other people, where we don't feel love toward other people, where we have huge judgments or criticisms. I think, you know, we need a systematic way to live with an awakened mind and an open, loving, compassionate heart. I think that's what we're after. You know, the, and I have to, um, I, if I'm left to my own devices, I know I won't do it, all right? That, um, I think every single person here, if you're on earth, you're here with a mission. And that mission, to some point, to some degree, is about reawakening, to let the light that is within shine into the without. You know, um, as a child back east, I remember that in the summer, we would have lots of fireflies. 
and uh, we'd sit on the piazza of my grandmother's house, and we'd wait till the sun went down, and then at some point it was dark enough, and the fireflies would sort of magically come out of the woods. And we would all have jars, you know, when we'd poke holes in the lids of the jars, and we would try and catch the fireflies. I'm, I'm really sorry, firefly fans, because they didn't live very long once they were in the jar. But when we were kids, we didn't really understand that component of the process, because we'd have a jar full of fireflies, you know, and this was really exciting, and we think they were going to last all night long. Well, they, they lasted a number of minutes, and then that was it. But, um, but there was something that was amazing and kind of dazzling and magical about these little, these little beings that were making light. Now, if an insect can carry light, if insects carry the light, surely you and I, as the sons and daughters of the Most High, we carry the light within us as well. And so I think that where we begin is that we make up our mind, quite simply, to let it shine. That it will change the course of our life if we do. So William James, who is uh, thought of as the founder of uh, Amer psychology in America, he said, to change one's life, there are three things you have to do. Start immediately. Do it flamboyantly. And make no exceptions. Yeah. So... Um, there was a man who'd had some difficult negative experiences with uh, people proselytizing and always coming to his front door and giving him information that he did not really want. And so one day he answers the door to a strange woman who, as he opens the door, she's handing him a booklet. And he slams the door and throws the booklet away, just <laughs> grousing, grousing, grousing. And this happens again about a week or so later. And this time, she asked if he was interested in the material that she had previously left. Yeah. And so he decided that it was time. He'd had enough of this. And he was going to confront this. And so he invited her into his house. And he pointed to the American flag over the fireplace. And he said, you know, I want you to salute that flag. And so she did. And he pointed to the Christmas tree. You know, when he asked her, now, do you deny the belief in celebrating Christmas? And she said, no. No, I, I believe in Christmas. And he thought to himself, well, OK, now I guess I'm converting her. Well, this is good. This is good. And so the, the homeowner handed the booklet back to the woman and said, is there anything you would like to say to me? And she says, well, yes, yes. Would you like to order anything? I'm your new Avon lady. <laughs> and uh, so you know, there is that. That line in the Bible about be kind to strangers because you never know when one of them is an angel in disguise. Let's pray. So we, <laughs> thanks. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment and just remember that right here, where we are, in this moment, we are surrounded and filled with God's spirit. God's loving, intelligent presence is the most true, real thing about each and every one of us. We are emanations of the most high God. And so as we join together in consciousness today, I know, I claim, and I believe that there is raising up for each and every one of us, that there is healing available, and we say yes to it. We welcome it. So I know for each and every one of us that whatever difficulty there is in our life today, that that spirit of God within us is so much more than that. And because we are people of faith, because we have belief, because we are grounded in spiritual principle, I know for each and every one of us, healing, perfect healing in the right and perfect way is taking place. And we say yes to it. So we include in our prayers today our family members and friends, our parents and children, all of our loved ones, those people we hold near and dear in our heart. And we just embrace them in a mantle of love and peace and healing. And we know that God's good is unfolding in their life right now. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. All paths. We just open our heart so that everyone, everyone everywhere is included. We let our prayer be a blessing energy in the world around us. So all of those things that look so difficult, that make us not have faith or make us fearful, we say the Spirit of God is present even there in the midst of that, as peace, as healing, as divine intelligence, as right order. So for all of this, I give great thanks. I know it is the truth. There is nothing in us to deny it. There's nothing working against us. We simply step into that finished kingdom. And so with a full heart, 
I give thanks and release this word. And so it is. Together we all say, Amen.